Welcome back. We continue our conversation with Admiral Craig Fowler, commander of U.S. Southcom. Let's talk about drug interdiction. I'm hoping at some point to be able to go down to visit your facility in Key West. Talk about the role that that plays and, and the importance of drug interdiction in what U.S. Southern Command does. Well, I'd love to have you down to Key West to join Interagency Task Force South. Uh, it's a team of teams, 22 nations, every interagency under one roof, fusing the picture together of the narcotics flow uh, to the United States of America and helps our partners because we detect things that are headed into their nations as well. The, uh, with the assets, the intelligence sharing, the, the fusion of information that we have, we had a very successful year last year in interdicting uh, cocaine principally. How do you define success? It was uh, 280 plus metric tons, which is roughly 10 lives per metric ton saved in the United States of America. Unfortunately, we have too much data on this over so many years. But you know, one death in the United States is too many. And we had the last solid year statistics over 70,000 deaths, and that's just too many. You said, I think in, in, I think I've read somewhere that you have said that, that as far as the drug interdiction budget for the United States, I think it's the United States or the military, 1.5% is, is is 1.5% um, is spent through the, the Joint Agency Task Force in Key West. Am I getting that number wrong? We have a very small percentage. Uh, we'll, we'll get you the exact figures. It is small, so it, you're not far off. And that small percentage goes to this team that's monitoring 24-7, Coast Guard, United States Coast Guard ships, uh, Customs and Border Protection assets, P-3s, U.S. Navy, uh, P-8s, some small number of U.S. Navy ships, and we work with our partners. And last year, about 50% of all our interdictions were partner-assisted, which is a significant improvement. Partners like El Salvador that are really stepping up and interdicting as many miles as two, 300 miles off their coast. Do you have a sense for, based on what you interdict, how much is getting through? So any amount that gets through is too much, but we're probably only getting about 10% of what actually comes through. Nine to 10% is what we estimate. So you think you're catching 90% of it? No, we're 90% is getting through. 90% is getting through, okay, okay. That's it's not, while well, we had a solid year and our interdiction numbers were, were close to a record, it's not enough. That's a, I mean, that's a, a shocking number, 10% being, being apprehended. It is. It starts at the source. So it starts in Colombia. And the current administration and the current team in Colombia, we were just there last week, spent a week in Colombia. We went out and saw some of their efforts. They are they're getting after it. Their, their eradication is up. But people have to have jobs. And it also goes all the way to the street in the United States. So that getting that whole picture together. And then you add in some of these chemical-based drugs like fentanyl that you can manufacture with com in, the, in the mail and mix and make even le more lethal concoctions. And it's a, it again points to the global nature of this problem that we're fighting. Uh, wh where do you, is the, is, the, is the transactional nature of the, the transshipment mostly over land or are we seeing it through the Caribbean? I know it shifts, like when there's a major effort in trying to catch it and coming through the Caribbean, then it starts coming in up through Mexico. When we crack down on Mexico, it starts coming in through the Caribbean. Where is your assessment now as to where it's coming through? So cocaine, which is the principal commodity that we uh, track and detect, monitor, and uh, participate in the interdictions through Joint Interagency Task Force Self, GIS South, is uh, at sea. It's more effective uh, economically for the ter for the criminal organizations, but it also goes by land and by air. We've seen an increase in uh, in the non-commercial airflow, particularly out of Venezuela. Is uh, Haiti still a major transshipment point? I'd say there's some trans uh, transshipment through the island countries. Uh, it wouldn't just point to Haiti, though. Uh, I want to go back for a second to, to China, the discussion there, because I found some of this to be truly fascinating. Because you, you told a story about um, how you were meeting with, with a, a, a counterpart at another country, and 
they were talking about uh, the aid that they were getting from, or the assistance that they were getting, or the blank check that they were almost getting from China. I think uh, I think it was like $23 million. Do you, do you know the story I'm referring to? Tell, tell me tell me about that. Well, I mentioned at the outset that China has principal and legitimate economic interests. They'll go to whatever lengths is necessary to secure those interests. And what we're seeing is an increase in military assistance, gifts, uh, for one, because they know that many nations in this region are cash-strapped. So we see an increase in gifts. We see an increase in um, education offers, free scholarships. They've taken some of our curriculum, converted it into uh, uh, their Chinese and Spanish, and just introduced enough of Chinese doctrine into it to make it uh, palatable to their own leadership. Uh, a couple times sitting down with counterparts after we get to know each other when they're open and honest with me, they'll admit that they received 20 million, 23 million, 14 million, 17 million. I press, I say, what, what are we talking about here? And don't worry, I'm not, it's not, it's not IT equipment. Well, you can buy a lot of uniforms for 23, 20 million dollars. So I know they're, they're, uh, they're getting assistance. And that's compared to what the U.S. is, well, and what's the U.S. giving? That country that you were citing before, you said 23 million blank check from China, and what, were, what was the U.S. payment to them? Our security assistance is significantly smaller. I think you said about one and a half million. It's about that, and I, but I would offer that a, a dollar of the U.S. money and a year at uh, one of our war colleges um, is, um, is worth is the gold standard. That's again goes back to why our partners want to partner with us. Would it be? Uh, have you felt that you know? I know that there's been an effort to take money from military spending to build the wall on the on the southern border. I realize you don't have anything to do with Mexico. You're you are Mexico South, not not the not Mexico itself. Are there resources that if we had more finances to be able for? beefing up what's being done in Key West, the type of military aid that could be given to some of these other countries, that, that, that those dollars might be better spent in that way than on the border? Well, I think to effectively combat the scourge of transnational criminal organizations and all the things they traffic, narcotics, humans, dr guns, uh, you need a complete zone defense. So I look at what's, what we're doing along the border as the goal line stand. And I look at our effort as linebackers and defensive backs. We need to have this system of systems together. And so uh, I think it all plays a role, including economic efforts. And I will go back to the need for intelligence support. That includes surveillance from aircraft. I just want to get your response on the, the base in Argentina that China has built for deep space. Um, who poses a greater threat militarily to the United States and Latin America, Russia or China? China is looking to have access and influence where they can, and that includes in space. Uh, we look at uh, the, the competition between Russia and China, and given the, the strength of the Chinese economy and, and where we see them making inroads around the, the world, I focus more on China in our future defense efforts than I do on Russia. Um, before coming to Southcom, you were the senior military advisor to then Defense Secretary Jim Mattis, right, correct? Senior military assistant. Senior military assistant, I apologize. Um, Jim Mattis a good man? Uh, Secretary Mattis, General Mattis is a, is a fine uh, leader, outstanding leader, a mentor, and uh, I have the utmost respect for him. I got to ask you a couple of questions about what's been in the news recently. The Washington Post book, A Very Stable Genius, describes a scene that took place in July 2017 in the tank in which the president, during a briefing, dressed down Jim Mattis and a number of other generals that were, and admirals that were in the room, military staff that was in the room. Um, were you in that meeting? I won't comment on any proceedings of the tank or any private proceedings that I was a part of, and I think it's unprofessional uh, from uh, military personnel that have commented on that. I just want to get your reaction. According to um, the book, the president berated Secretary Mattis and the leaders there as a bunch of losers, a bunch of dopes, and babies. I won't comment on any internal proceedings. All my dealings with the president, he's, he's very uh, affable and very positive and very supportive of the military. and. And I have utmost respect for Secretary Mattis and his uh, outstanding leadership and service to our nation. Are you enjoying the job? I love the job. What do you love most about it? The people. You come to work here at uh, Interall, that people are so passionate and knowledgeable about what they're doing. They're committed. 
Uh, there's a lot of longevity here, brings this depth of experience and understanding the cultural nuances of the region. It's just, uh, it's an honor to be here and uh, I'm just humbled to be able to, and, and grateful to be able to lead such an outstanding team in a wonderful, vibrant community like this. Admiral, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Now, as SOUTHCOM Commander Admiral Fowler also oversees the Guantanamo Bay military base in Cuba. We discussed the ongoing detention of accused terrorists and how long that base will remain open. You can find that portion of our interview online at CBSMiami.com, as well as a discussion about the future of Haiti. We'll be right back.